the talk so far? Yes, awesome. Well, this talk comes with a warning. I'm going to make you a little bit uncomfortable. Raise your hand if you know the origin of the phrase paradigm shift. Any science fans in the room? Oh, one person knows the origin of paradigm shift, our CTO, Rebecca Parsons. Uh, for the rest of you, gather around, and I'm going to tell you a short story about the origin of the paradigm shift. In 1962, Thomas Kuhn, an American physicist and a historian of science, coined the term paradigm shift in a book he called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. His book at the time was very controversial and made a lot of scientists uncomfortable. What he shared was that the science progresses through four phases. The first phase he called the phase of normal science, where scientists are doing explorations and working based on the assumptions and theories of the existing paradigm. They're essentially looking to prove what they expect to see, and there isn't a whole bunch of critical thinking going on. The second phase, they run into a bunch of anomalous observations, observations that don't, don't quite fit the existing norm. And then they go into the crisis, right? They cannot simply solve their problems based on the existing theories, and that's where they begin to think out of the box, and we shift into the revolutionary science. Essentially, we're shifting from incremental improvements to a completely new order. So when scientists couldn't prove the observations they, could, they were making in the subatomic levels, they moved from Newtonian mechanics to quantum mechanics. But what does that have anything to do with data? I think we are in the Kuhnian crisis phase when it comes to data. The existing paradigms on how to unlock data, how to transform our organizations to become data-driven, simply don't work. The inconvenient truth is that companies are failing in their effort to become data-driven, to become AI first, and fundamentally compete based on analytics. This is based on our own experience and observations, as well as industry reports. The New Vantage report, which is a C-level executive survey done across CIOs and chief analytics officers, chief data officers, jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago, uh, observes that there is a significant increase in the absolute amount of dollars and also the pace of investment, the only over the course of last year, from 2018 to 2019, we, we see a, a significant increase in the number of companies that are investing $50 million to $500 million or $500 million above in AI and big data, while the confidence of those the, in, um, the executives in seeing measurable results, seeing a downfall. And with 77% of executives are still believing adopting big data is a problem. And while they're accepting that there are pockets of innovations happening using data, they are ranking themselves failing on every transformational measure, transforming to become data-driven, create a data-driven culture, or use data as assets, or essentially compete based on analytics. Let's look at a couple of industries. Retail has been one of the first industries that adopt, adopted data, and you know, they have made a lot of investments. When, when you look at retail's data ecosystem today, it's full of disconnections and missing links. The data about behavior of the customer is disconnected across channels. The marketing data is disconnected from the browse behavior, behavioral data on the e-commerce side. And I'm sure a lot of you have a retail function in your organizations. Raise your hand if you, the customer 360 is still a challenge, if you have a retail function. There's some heads being shaved and a few hands being raised. Let's talk about healthcare. The state of the healthcare data is rather dark. For the science fans in the room, it's like dark matter in the universe. It exists, but we can't see it. We can't really use it. Dark data um, is a term that Gardner defines as data that your system generates, but they're hidden inside the systems. Your operation data that's being ge generated day to day, but you can't really get to it. How many of you have changed your doctors and got a new doctor, and when you met with your new doctor, you have to give them an oral history of your medical results, or have, you know, have, 
um, been given some care that is based on statistical popula population health, but it's not suitable for well, where your health benchmark is. Right? Wouldn't it be possible, wonderful if we had all of the bio, um, biometrics or the lab results that we have received, and we've done twice a year, we've been good citizens and doing these tests twice a year at our fingertip over the course of the years. But that's not the case of the um, state of data in healthcare, and at least in North America, HIPAA, uh, legislation around data privacy and security, sometimes is the one to blame. Uh, quick quiz, don't cheat and look at your phones. Um, what, what do you think the P in HIPAA stands for? Good. It's not privacy or protection, it's portability. Thank you. So, what is the problem? Becoming a data-driven organization is a really difficult challenge. There is an organization component to it. How do we align our incentives? How do we measure success? How do we or, you know, structure the organization? But the technology has a big part in that, and technology is at the core of it. Um, and I, I'm going to try really hard to simplify this because it's a very complex and a hairy space how to manage big data and how to be, be build AI and analytics, analytics on the top of it, but I'm going to simplify it to its essential characteristics. If you zoom out to a 50,000 feet view in any enterprise organization and look at their big data enterprise architecture, it looks like this. There is a big fat box sitting in the middle, it's the data lake or data platform or whatever it's called, the next generation data platform, and its job is to pull data from hundreds of systems and domains across the organization, run them through a bunch of pipelines, normalize them, cleanse them, and make them available for thousands of you know, consumption scenarios. Fuel the business intelligence reports, in, empower the data scientists to do explorations and train the, the um, you know, machine learning models or feed the data-driven applications. Is there anything wrong with this picture? A centralized monolithic system simply doesn't scale if data is ubiquitous across the organization and beyond the boundary of your organization, and if the or innovation agenda of your, uh, of your organization requires a constant change in how you model the data, how you aggregate it, how you view it, how you access it. So a centralized and monolithic system is a problem of scale. And if you zoom down to a 30,000 feet view, the look at the life of the people who are building this platform, what you see is a silo of hyper-specialized ML and data engineers. And they've been tasked to get data from teams across the organization that, to be honest, have, have no incentive to share correct, trustworthy, meaningful data to them without having any domain expertise, make sense of that data, without having any domain expertise, how this data is supposed to be used, make it useful to the rest of organization. I, to be honest, I don't envy the life of this group of people. What's wrong with this? Anything wrong? No? Silo. This process is full of friction, and the skill set gap remains and will grow. A little quick, Fact, I just searched this on LinkedIn before coming in. There are 46,000 jobs right now open in North America for data engineers. I mean, I didn't search for ML engineers and data analysts and all the other titles that they have, but there are only 37,000 proclaimed data engineers on LinkedIn platform in North America. And this, this silo of skill set gap will only grow as, as long as we silo data to be a different you know, problem in the corner of the organization. And finally, how we are executing, building our data platforms is fairly disconnected. We start with building the platform, disconnected from how it's going to be used, disconnected from the outcome, disconnected from where the data actually needs to be unlocked. We are, we are gener basically created a solution that is based on centralized architecture, delivered by silo of tools specialists, and according to a disconnected execution plan. And if you have any of these failure symptoms that we often see in the wild, um, fail to bootstrap a very difficult platform, fail to scale the source, fail to scale, uh, scale the consumption models, and eventually fail to materialize and get any value and transform your organization, I promise that technology has something to do with it. And it's not that we haven't been trying, right? Whenever we had a problem, naturally the solution has been the next generation data platform, right? 
It was the warehousing generation, proprietary software was very expensive. We fired those folks. We thought Data Lake was the answer. And the next solution is Data Lake on the cloud. So let's pause for a moment, go back to Thomas Kuhn observations. What have we been doing? Normal science. We've been playing in the normal science phase for 30 years. We've been trying to solve our problem based on the 30-year-old assumptions of data warehousing. What do we need to do? We need a paradigm shift. We need to think differently about how to solve the data problem. What I'm going to share with you are the ingredients of the most successful projects that we've had, and also br bringing learnings from modern architecture in operational domains back to the data domains. We need to imagine data differently. Instead of imagining data as this one big box that's going to centralize everything, and I have to apologize to Anita because I know she had a dream to centralize the data, <laughs> we need to break it apart and create this wonderful ecosystem of domain-driven data sets. And I'm not talking about the siloed operational databases of our domains. I'm talking about every domain having an accountability and be empowered to share their analytical data, their facts of business, those time series data that shows how their domain is operating and doing business day to day, and share that in an easily consumable way. We need to change our mental model from this flow of shoving data from right to left, from the you know, source systems to the lake up to the consumers, to this ecosystem and mesh of the domain-driven data products. And most importantly, the domains need to be accountable, need to have the ownership of sharing this analytical data because they know their domains intimately. And the domains obviously vary within the different industries. If you're in, um, in health industry, claims your lab results, your medical records, these are the domains that you need to unlock. If you want to treat data as an asset, we need to treat it as such, right? Data needs to be treated as a product. If you talk to any data scientist, they would tell you that 80 to 90% of their time is spent on finding the data, making sense of it, and then turn it into the format or shape that they can actually use it. And that's where we can bring product thinking and those best practices of product ownership to data so that we can you know, make the experience of that data scientist delightful. We make data discoverability the first class capability. Uh, we will publish the quality metrics of the data. We will do a great job in documenting that and managing the life cycle of data. We need to change how we measure success. Great success metric, decreased lead time for that data scientist to be able to find the data and use it. And we need to create new roles, data product owner, someone within the domain that cares about the life cycle of the data, evangelizes the existence of data and the use case of that domain-oriented data within the organization. And if you've been listening, I know by now you're probably wondering how we're going to deal with the complexity of technology that we've tr been trying to centralize, right? It's not easy for each of these data domains to deal with the technology complexity, to ingest data, to process it, to serve it, to store it. How can we avoid duplicate effort and inconsistency in the storage layer or compute layer? There are a lot of technical considerations here in terms of how can I make the data localized to where the compute happens. Uh, and the technology landscape is fairly complicated. And that's where self-serve data infrastructure come to play, that we can abstract away these fundamental ingredients of the technology platform when it comes to the field of data and create higher levels of abstraction, create a team that their job is decreasing lead time for the creation of these data products and abstract away automated in an automated way to create the bl blueprint and scaffolding of the data products. And if anybody has worked with distributed architecture and distributed systems, know that no distributed system works without having interoperability and standardization. Standardization is key to get this ecosystem of data products to co play together, be able to join customer information across different domains. So the, the federated governance model and strong emphasis on this in standardization is the key. And this nice ecosystem of well-playing you know, domain-driven data sets owned by cross-functional teams with product ownership is what we call a data mesh architecture. 
when it comes to execution, how do we execute this platform? How do we build it? Where do we get started? That's where we would use this connected intelligence cycle. We start looking at points of actions and interaction systems and domains that actually call the data today. We create the data products that now unlock the data. We think about how we can build intelligence on top of that to automate some of the decision making and augment those systems with these automated and intelligent decision makers. And we do that loop a few times. And as we run these iterations, we build the foundation, we unlock more data products. So we use this cycle of connected intelligence as a, as a vehicle to execute building the platform. In summary, the pillars of a connected intelligence or a data mesh architecture include decentralized domain-oriented architecture and most importantly ownership to scale out data as a product to improve discoverability, usability, and the quality of the data. Self-serve infrastructure to abstract away technical complexity and create autonomy of the data product teams. And putting an ecosystem governance model that emphasizes, emphasizes standardization and ecosystem play. And finally, execute building the platform based on connected intelligence cycle and iterations. And as the wisdom, 2,500-year-old wisdom of Tao Te Ching tells us, the journey of a thousand miles begins with the first step. So imagine for a moment that I was successful and I nudged you to give connected intelligence and data mesh a try. What would you do when you go back? What would be the first steps? Pick one to three bets that are data-driven for your 2020 vision. Align your OKRs, your incentives, your measure of success with liberation of these data products. And if you have any questions about execution, implementation, engineering, and infrastructure, come and talk to us. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.